Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good? Great. It's 6.33 and we just started. Um, th uh, thank you, DJ, for the background music. Uh, tonight uh, is the launch of a project that's been in the works for quite a long time, since last year. And of course, as you know, it's called Seeking the Periphery. Um, it is virtual, of course. Um, today is, as we all know, the one year anniversary of the pandemic. Um, coincidentally, it was sunny and spring-like. It was very hopeful, kind of an auspicious day for an exhibition launch. So that, that was kind of sweet. Although we do also want to reflect on all the, all, all the folks that have suffered um, throughout this pandemic. Um, there, you know, there, there is both joy and suffering in, in this exhibition as well. Um, there are various projects uh, and, and explorations that touch on so many different aspects of our, our, our lives. <clears throat> I'm just gonna post a quick picture as an intro image. Um, here we go. Share screen. Um, so, I don't know if many of you know who Grayson Perry is, but uh, I just, just got discovered this exhibition that he curated for the Royal Academy of, Academy of Arts, which of course is a, a teaching place, uh, a, a school. Um, this was the 250th summer spring exhibition. And um, I encourage you to find this on YouTube because it's wonderful. He packed the Academy with work uh, and of every every sort, and um, it it was an incredible show. I wish I could have gone, um, but this is sort of the you know obviously if we had the budget and the kind of uh, uh, access to 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 space, a real space like this, you know this is sort of the the ambition behind re retroactively behind. Um, uh, uh, this exhibition and it really uh, uh, is quite inspirational because he's like the, the best kind of artist. I think he's extremely inclusive, extremely interested in, in artists around him, ex exchange, um, he's very public and, and quite outrageous too, which is, which is part of his way of communicating. Um, I know that you've, probably all familiar, familiar with the content of this show, which is sort of a, I mean, it was written up in a kind of heady way, uh, you know, sort of about referencing Walter Benjamin and all this stuff, but really um, the work is very broad and very diverse. And that was the intent, even though the focus is through architecture and the kind of lens is through um, the iconic image and what, where we are today and what, what the iconic, iconic image created and represented and, and manifested in the 20th century. And of course, as I'm sure some of you have been through the exhibition and some of you are just starting, so you'll see how, how we position this in relation to the iconic image. A uh, couple of things. Uh, there are two places where you can talk to each other or, or, or ask questions. So uh, preferably questions, which we'll get to hopefully at the end, there's a Q&A room, uh, but there's also a chat room that is open to you. I believe you can communicate with each other. So if some of you haven't seen each other for a while, you can certainly say hello. And uh, this is an art opening after all, and this sort of thing happens at art openings. So I want to uh, start off uh, by introduce introducing our first panelists. There are three and four, if you include me, um, Ken Moffat, is going to speak very briefly about his contribution and his work. Through his work as the Jack Layton Chair, Ken Moffat helps students explore engagement with justice issues, working against social exclusion. Ken is particularly interested in the imaginative possibilities for social change and through the Layton Chair to provide a space where students and community members can meet to experiment with multiple modes of personal and political expression. 
Ken's research expertise includes art criticism, the effects of neoliberalism on education, community-based social interventions, as well as critical reflective practice and pedagogy. And most importantly, Ken has a passion for art and architecture. Um, and as a contributor to this ex exhibition, Ken will start off with a few words. Welcome, Ken Moffat. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, Dimitri and the other curators. Um, I am so happy to be part of this show. I got to look at it last night for the first time, and it's a very strong show, and I feel very proud to be in it. Um, I um, also, it's very much what I'm interested in, the periphery. What are the voices from the periphery? What are the forms that the periphery um, creates? Um, the notion of the periphery uh, versus the center, whatever that is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my piece, um, but I'm just gonna walk, I don't have visuals, instead I'll just walk you through it. Um, my periphery piece here is about um, R.M. Vaughan or Richard Vaughan. Um, and it's about myself in a way, it's a memoir. I like to think of it, it reads like an article perhaps, but in fact, I like to think of it as an art piece in the way the French um, artist Sophie Cal talks very much about her life and uses text and imagery to talk in a very confessional way in a manner. So about R.M. Vaughan or Richard Vaughan. Richard Vaughan had an art career in Toronto, Montreal, Berlin, and his home province of New Brunswick, Fredericton and St. John. He was the national art critic for the Globe and Mail. He is the author of fiction, poetry, social criticism, art criticism. He was a Renaissance man, if you may, um, in terms of doing film, install, installation and curating. Then in the fall of 2020, a week before he was to be a guest lecturer in my art and social transformation class, he suicided or we assume that he suicided. To the best of our knowledge, he jumped from a bridge into the icy waters of the St. John River in Fredericton while he was an artist in residence at the University of New Brunswick. This sudden shock to myself and those close to him made me wonder about Richard, wonder about death and wonder about creativity and the periphery um, but specifically his attachment to home because he lived in my home for a while, but he visited my home regularly as well. Um, in what you would see in my submission is a kind of do it yourself form of photography. Every piece of photograph in that submission is either from my iPhone or a picture I took of my iPhone. Um, uh, sometimes by a friend um, close to Richard or sometimes by myself. Little did I know when these pictures were being taken that it was gonna end up being a meditation on death and on voice. Um, so what you'll see is the documentation of a life but also a memoir. I'm purposely put myself in it subjectively. Um, image of him posing me, um, images of him in the houses of other artists, including Sandra Rekiko in Toronto, Dom Boyd Aronson in Montreal, a discussion of RM's own home in Berlin and my home, and finally a rental home in Fredericton and in a way, him going back to be writer in residence was a return to home. So in a way, they're brief tableaus or snippets, impressions, interpretations. But there's also a whole effective life or emotional frame to it, which is the frame of grief, wonderment, anger, frustration, anxiety, um, all against the background of COVID. And when I think of those emotions, they're kind of emotions of home, aren't they? I mean, home, it can be a very inclusive place, but it can also include those many troubling emotions. Um, 
Also, just in terms of uh, just an architectural comment, every home he chose was a very interesting home. Uh, Sandra's home, Don's home, his own home, my home, if I might. Um, very uh, aesthetically pleasing home, except for one, which was his home in Berlin, which was very austere, very modernist, and made me for the first time realize how Richard is very much an aesthete. Um, so home is not necessarily a permanent structure. It's not the big suburban home uh, with the garage necessarily, could be, but it's also a social, cultural, moving, constantly in motion form of architecture. So that's my comments. Thank you, Ken. Thank you dearly. Um, our next contributor and uh, panelist is Samantha Wavy. Uh, at Ryerson, Samantha Wavy is a professor at the School of Social Work and graduate program director, documentary media, MFA, as well as creative development lead at the Office of Social Innovation, all at Ryerson. Her research and practice interests uh, international issues and grassroots community activism and organizing in Canada and abroad, including, including Lebanon, uh, from which she comes. Uh, her work has explored the complexities of urban landscapes and issues of displacement, post-colonialism, and translocality. Uh, and her scholarship explores inter interdisciplinary intersections of art, community practice, and pedagogy. And as a contributor to this ex exhibition, please welcome Samantha. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Dimitri, for including me in the show and the panel today. Um, like my colleague Ken, I'm very, very excited to be here. I had a chance to look at all the contributions, and there's such breadth uh, and diversity of submissions. It was really just a joy to look at them. Um, I want to actually build on Ken's concept of home. I think as someone who's experienced displacement, at last count, I think I've lived in 22 places. Um, and when I say lived, I don't mean visited. I mean lived, worked, studied, lived. And so this idea of home becomes a very fluid concept um, that's actually shaped by geopolitical relations, by politics, by uh, histories of colonialism, as well as contemporary relations. And in this particular work that I have in the exhibition right now, City of Science, Signs of City, I actually look at architecture as a constant, but a constant that's always shifting. And so I like to think of the, the concept of disjunction as a search not necessarily of harmony and unity, but as, as, as a search for hybridity um, and all of the different aspects of experience that can come together. Uh, I'd like to show a few images from the work. Actually, these are the images that I took I'm gonna share my screen, that become part of the work. I wanted to capture that idea of movement and motion in the work. And so these are all images that I took in uh, Lebanon and in Canada and different places that I've actually brought together to challenge this idea of cultural authenticity and instead to talk about or to evoke the concept of hybridity and cultural hybridity. Now, you know, you begin to see a little bit of critique. I think the more you look at these images, you see a bit of a cultural critique, uh, a political critique, and that's really been a thread throughout my work. Um, I would say that my work is reflexive in nature, but it's also autoethnographic. So as uh, Dimitri mentioned, a lot of my background has many different aspects to it. There's the photography aspect, there's the, uh, social work aspect, the community organizing aspect, and all of these came together in my search to kind of find a different way to look at documentary and to look at how we document our experience of home, uh, especially in the context of displacement, especially in the context of bringing these different uh, contexts together and what that might mean. Uh, so in the work started as this series that I call Continuities, uh, which brought together the different environments. And from there evolved into a video work. Um, and then that video work, spawned, which is part of the, uh, part of the show, actually spawned different 
uh, different iterations, including a socially engaged project where I actually engaged people in speaking to each other via postcard format about what home uh, looks like to them and what that experience of cultural hybridity is. So there is a there is as you as you will see there is a lot of emphasis on structure built structure um, more than the natural environment or at least the relationship between the two and um, I think that for me is very important because a lot of times I'll be you know on a more personal uh, level I'd be walking through a city and I go I've been here before but not here in another city. Um, and it's just that experience of those contexts melting and merging together uh, that I tried to evoke in this particular work. Um, and for me, the way to represent that was this idea of stitching and bringing together these, um, these environments that are actually not environments that coexist in physical space, but definitely coexist at the sense of memory they coexist at a sense of um, belonging, at a sense of experience, and all as a comment on home. So you see buildings that are uh, new buildings, as well as buildings that are currently under construction and buildings that are ravaged by war. Uh, you, you know, so there is like a mul multiplicity of ways of expressing the cityscape that became really important in my work. Um, I think I will stop here and uh, I'll see if there are any other questions, if there are any questions a little bit later and I'm looking forward to hearing from the other panelists on this question. Thank you, Samantha. Um, before we get to our third and final panelist, Colin Ripley, I just also want to thank um, in the department, because Colin is in our department, uh, three co-curators uh, students that, that are here on your screen as well. Um, uh, in, my, in order on my screen, we have Sana Kadri, uh, Andrea Bickley, and Emily Pagu. Um, there are a couple of other students that, that have also recently joined the team and they're, they're not here on the screen, but I, I also want to thank Alexandra Bursno and Eileen Xiao uh, for behind the scenes work, which is really been amazing. Thank you. Colin, Colin Ripley uh, is a professor in and also past chair at the, at, uh, the Department of Arch Architectural Science here at Ryerson. Interestingly, Colin holds a Bachelor of Engineering from McMaster, uh, a Master's of Science in Theoretical Physics from the University of Toronto, and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. He's currently finishing a PhD in philosophy, art, and critical thought at the European Graduate School. Colin is also author or editor of several books about architecture on a wide range of topics, including mega regional urbanism, responsive envelope systems, sonic architecture, Canadian modern architecture, and the modern concept of the house as understood through the writings of Jean Genet. Wow. Uh, please welcome Colin Ripley to our panel of contributors tonight. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, when you, uh, uh, when this exhibition came up, I was uh, for a moment a bit stuck because I wasn't sure how I would respond to the question of the periphery. Um, but in the end, I just thought, you know, I've been working on this long project uh, dealing with Jean Genet and the question of home, of course, comes up constantly. Uh, Genet never lived in a house, but he designed and built houses, which he gave away, right? But also the question of the periphery was very important to him, you know, in his dealings, both geographical periphery in his travels around the world, uh, mostly not documented, in his um, uh, relationships with people of uh, uh, let's say Middle Eastern descent, Palestinians, uh, North Africans, with his, uh, some of his, his late work that dealt directly with the, the Palestinian conflict or uh, his work with the Black Panthers in the United States. Um, so, and of course, then I realized, well, the question of periphery is a constant for him because even if he's not on the geographic periphery, he is on the periphery of thought, let's say, as a 
homosexual thief in you know 1930s, 40s, 50s France, there is a way that he has been um, peripheralized. And this very much is what my project is about because uh, part of what I'm looking at is the way that architecture peripheralizes, that architecture determines or architecture forms the idea through its fun fundamental ideas of inside and outside. It starts to determine what is home, what is central, what is allowed to be central and what is forced to be peripheral which of course we realize becomes a political question, becomes a very kind of deep question. Anyway, uh, I'm not gonna go into depth of, of that. I'm just gonna say that at the moment when this project came up, came up uh, we were, so I'm working on this large project, which we call Stealing Home the on the klepto kleptogenetics of architecture. Um, and so I decided to, at the point when this came up, we were, work, we were working on this both through text and through drawing, through design. And we were in the process of drawing a series of imaginary brothels based on historical brothels of what, what we know about historical brothels, but not kind of slavishly tied to to the, the, the past. Uh, that, that work is still in progress, but there are five of them, the five first ones that we've come up, which are all historical. I think we're moving past the historical point now, but the historical ones are all present uh, in your show, in this show. So that's exciting. Uh, I just wanna finish by reading a very short text that I wrote that starts to, that is part of the, part of the dissertation at EGS actually, but don't be scared. <laughs> it's not heavy theory at all. It's one of the disruptive texts. So we all know the story of the first house. The people were wanderers, always in search of food. They traveled in groups, family groups mostly. They slept around the fire in skin or tents. Maybe they had stable sexual partnerships, maybe not. Probably not. Paternity was probably a loose concept. After a time, the people settled down. They started to grow crops to domesticate animals, but the goats kept running away. So they kept them tied up. And the goats ate through the rope. So the people built a big box out of stone or maybe dried mud or wood to keep the goats safe. Anyway, they needed somewhere to keep the crops safe, especially over the winter, safe from the rain and wild animals and maybe from other people. When some of the women tried to run away from the men, why they wanted to leave doesn't matter. Maybe one of them wanted to run off with a young lover and start a new group. They were locked in the goat house for a few hours at first, but they just tried to run away again. In any case, the men soon found this was inconvenient and started to keep them and the other unruly women locked up all the time, except for work and sex. But the goat house soon became too small and the men soon realized they needed to keep the children locked up with the women anyway. So they built a new house just for the women, a house they could visit whenever they wanted sex. Maybe this was communal at first, but soon each man who was a man built his own house to keep his own women and his own children and his own goats available for his use. So the first house was a brothel and the first brothel was a prison and the first prison was a goat shed. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. I'm going to... Um, just lead off with a, a very question. All my questions are really general. So you could go any direction you want with this, but it goes something like this. Why is the topic of representation important today? In architecture, we often approach the subject visually in terms of style or a technique to describe a concept, a design or an idea. 
Um, in other cultural practices, we think more about the who and the what is represented uh, and maybe where does representation happen outside of the gallery. Uh, this extends to issues of space, both real and virtual. Uh, as <laughs> knew that was gonna happen. As this exhibition contains multitudes of representational content and knowledge, the question for the panel is, what do each of you think is important to consider uh, of representational culture today, moving forward? Who would like to kick it off? Ari? Go, Sam. You want to go, Sam? It's okay, you can go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, um, I started with a very sociological, social work kind of way to approach this, I was thinking, and then I got think of a totally different way, at, at which I'm just as interested in this space and architecture. Um, but actually, before I do that, I just want to mention that I know Keith Cole, I noticed him in the attendees here, very close collaborator with Richard Vaughn close friend, close collaborator, and I want to acknowledge his presence here. Um, so in terms of representation, I lately have been watching a lot of artist talks on YouTube as a way to keep myself <laughs> anchored in something. And I was listening to Theister Gates talk about architecture in South Chicago. And he was talking about the loss of a cathedral in that neighborhood and the sadness of the loss of the building itself. And then I got thinking of buildings as representations and then the sadness and the loss of buildings. And for me, there's been, and I also got thinking about Richard. What, where could Richard fit in a home? Maybe in a residential hotel, maybe in one of those hotels that, that they used to have in New York that are quickly disappearing, like the Chelsea Hotel. So I'm going to just take a moment on the Chelsea Hotel, which is a form of representation to me. It was a form as a younger man, I used to imagine this place. The Chelsea Hotel was an old Victorian, I believe, structure in the middle of the street, huge old hotel, um, where artists would meet, artists would live, some would come and go, some would stay permanently, some are still there, even as it's been turned to a condo, they refuse to leave. So these public spaces, these architectural spaces become really important as social cultural possibilities of representation. And then within those spaces, you can have different forms of outside, being an outsider or a periphery. So maybe I'll stop there for that. Um, and I'll come back if there's time. Uh, I'd like to build on that a little bit and um, think about the spaces that are around us and how they shift. So sometimes they shift because their purpose changes, repurposed buildings, for example. But sometimes they shift, like for those of us who come from backgrounds that are um, shaped where, where, where the architecture is shaped by war, um, you actually see that shifting movement. So in some of my images, for example, I made sure to capture some of that because the, the, the impact is so clear on the architecture and then how the architecture then responds by things like, you know, nature taking over, uh, you know, buildings that are caved in uh, that all of a sudden become monuments of something, monuments of an experience, monuments of a, uh, of a time past, but also of resilience, of people's resilience. Uh, so I think for me, the, my relationship with architecture has just always been so profound because of what I saw around me and how that continued to influence my relationship to the landscape. Um, I love being out in nature that is not as built, but I also love being in the city. Um, I love being around and in buildings and around buildings specifically because I feel like they have a life of their own. Um, I think that makes me always think about that concept of authenticity um, and how authenticity is, has really been, um, how should I say, it has really been a minefield shall we say, of experiences 
uh, because it's been used to categorize, it's been used to um, uh, politicize at times, to depoliticize an experience. Um, but all in all, it's that idea of the shifting. So that experience of shifting identity, I see that really reflected in the shifting landscape around me and specifically the shifting cityscape around me. Uh, whether, as I said, it's changing because of a different purpose now or a different group uh, or different um, group of people uh, experiencing the space differently or doing things differently with the space or how the politics of the place impact that experience of uh, the landscape, the built cityscape, um, and that experience of hybridity and, and connections that we have. Um, this is a really tough question, Dimitri. Uh, I know you said it's a general question, but I think it's really difficult. Um, um, I think, uh, for me, following the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years, I think I have to start by saying that representation is all there is. Mm -hmm. That we are, we, you know, that we could go back as far as you want in philosophy, and probably go back to Descartes and say, you know, when we say we, that's a representation. Right. And that, that's what Descartes missed, right? When, when he said, I think, therefore I am, he thought that the I actually existed. Right. Uh, I think what we would say now, or what I would say at least, is that you know, the I in the, in the cogito is, is nothing more than an architectural fantasy. And I say architectural fantasy purposefully because again, it's the, it's the, uh, uh, it's the, it's the, the fact of the inside and outside, right? Which is, well, as soon as you have inside and outside, you have architecture, but you can't have the self without having inside and outside. So, so that, that's the one side, but, but the, other, the other thing that, that comes to me with representation, I'm, I mean, you know, we're, in my work, I'm, I'm, I'm consciously and fairly strenuously working with representation in a, in a kind of, you know, architectural lay meaning of the word, right? In that, you know, I'm insistent that this stuff has to go through drawing and, you know, my, the people at EGS couldn't care less about the drawing, right? That they would rather it's not there, but it's there. So, um, so you know, that's, that's one thing. But, but one thing that I've, that I've come to is that any kind of representation is, is a form of violence. Because as soon as something is represented, something else is not represented. And this is inevitable and unavoidable. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't represent, right? I'm just saying that, that the, the violence inherent in it is something that we can't get away from. You're muted, Dimitri. I muted because of the dog, but I'm curious to what Ken might, um, yeah, you might feel I, about that statement. If I might, um, just this is very interesting. <laughs> um, I just want to first of all comment uh, what Colin said earlier is the periphery is always constant. It's kind of how I think um, that it really is always constant. And then you see in Sam's work, the constant motion, the change, there's a way the periphery is really what we're experiencing all the time. And it seems to me, and again, to go back to your work, Sam, like you show generic global effect, but it gets fractured quickly, right? And I think that's how we experience the city and that's how I love the city. And if we can be in that moment. And, um, and maybe just another quick comment around um, inclusion, exclusion. I agree representation is 
there's an implied violence and I'm a little preoccupied with global, generic, unliving representations, commercial representation that creates scripts people have to live in. But I'm also really interested, I think, in attachment and symbols. And I think we, if we can think what we're attached to and create symbols, we disrupt a sort of mm -hmm. discursive violence we're in. Let's mm. go. Thank you. That's really interesting too. Um, Samantha, please. Uh, it looks like you're about to say something as well. I could, I could comment, but I'd rather hear what you have to say. I was just going to say I'm listening to uh, Ken, and I'm thinking uh, it's it's quite something to represent or try to represent someone else. Thinking of what Colin said, I'm thinking of what Ken said, and looking at the images and that idea of home. Um, and the and the actual images that you chose to accompany the piece, it, you know, there's no coincidence, right? Why we pick certain images, they resonate, whether we know why they're resonating or not, we choose certain images, it's intentional, whether we know it's not, it is or it isn't. And I'm just wondering, um, what were some of the choices that guided you to choose certain images? Are you specifically asking me, Sam? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what you'll see is there's four or five images. Um, uh, one is me, to, so I'm not a neutral narrator. And I'm posed. The, the image that actually shows the piece on the page is actually one that Richard made me pose for. And that was the whole thing about Richard. He made people pose and uh, that could be a whole other written piece. But I don't pretend to capture, there's like, there's a kind of wonderment in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a kind of broad thinking about the periphery and how Richard ended up so peripheral, even though he looked like he was central to culture in Canada. Um, but there's also the very specific person. So those, uh, there's two images of him. One's blurred in someone else's environment. One's him with a cat, which he adored. He adored animals. So they're very personal images of him in a way. Um, anyone who knows Richard would recognize. Another is a goofy look of him. But then he creates these architectural structures that I think are like cardboard dioramas that birds eat from. You know, it's just like a quirk, but it's the man, it's the person, it's the attachment. So I guess part of it, to go back to attachment, I'm always encouraging students to think about what's your attachment? Uh, I got thinking, well, this is my attachment, my attachment's to Richard. So I get to go through my subjectivity to do that memoir. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps or answers what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, it definitely provides more depth to just seeing the images and then hearing how you've placed yourself in the images. It's a very intimate relationship to, to yes. those photographs. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Attachment, can one be, a, form attachments, uh, one can form attachments to many different things, including people and things. Um, from, the, from the viewpoint of the periphery and the idea of representation as being uh, any form of repre representation excludes and therefore is violent, et cetera, um, is, is the periphery a, a safe place to dwell? Is it something that, that is deeply personal? It's a, it's a home without the walls. Um, and can it also, <laughs> there's a lot going through my head right now, but can it also uh, be a, f a way to resist the, the script um, that can refer to as a, you know, as a kind of form of resistance without necessarily participating in, in, in violence? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely, and you know, I'm I'm going back to Janae yet again. It's just, uh, people who know me know it's the only thing I talk about these days. 
sorry. <laughs> but he, you know, he, uh, okay. there's two things. First, the one, one is the, the, the absolute truth that you can stay on the, on the periphery if you want to avoid, if, if your job, if your desire is simply to avoid. But if you want to do more than avoid, then you have to, you have to somehow um, argue against the peripheralization. You have to re move that periphery into the center somehow. Right. Um, I think this is what you know. Janet talks into about the center. A lot. And I, I think this is what he's talking about. The importance. Well, that's very area. interesting. I mean, once it's in the center, though, does it cease existing? The yeah. cease existing as the periphery, and does it become iconic? I would, I would say, the periphery is a very good place to be. I mean, I've never, I many people have no choice but to be in the periphery at all times, um, whether mm -hmm. it's through sexuality or race or gender, for example. Um, and so then it's a finding a way to welcome it and be it. Um, and I'm not sure we can always hearken to the center, but we can disrupt it. Yeah. 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 I, th I think what I'm very fair is, is that the periphery actually, you know, from the from this point of view that I'm that I'm trying to espouse here, the periphery doesn't actually exist. The periphery is a representation. Mm. It's it's mm -hmm. a concept that's that's been put forward by the center. Mm. So mm -hmm. you know, it, part of it is part of it is simply to deny that peripheralization, to refuse to accept that that you're on the periphery. Mm. Going back to Richard, because it, I think his narrative his story is, well, deeply personal, of course, recent history, very recent history. Um, Cam, how do you think he would, well, one should never speculate what somebody else thinks when they're not here, but what do you think he would think of this discussion and um, uh, where do you think he maybe saw himself in, in, the, in this space? Um, well, uh, first of all, I'm self-conscious because I know there's at least three people in this chat who knew him very well, <laughs> if not more. Right. Um, so it's a little hard to speak um, on a person's behalf. I, But I think we could all say he loved being queer. He loved the periphery. He liked um, do-it-yourself, rough art, uh, things from the edges. Um, I think he would love this type of talk, actually, in a very That's simple, great. simple way. But in terms Thank of you. perception, possibly more peripheral than I imagined. And then how we can know someone so well and still not know um, their attachments. Mm -hmm. the, the, that is the sadness, isn't it? Um, I wonder. There is one person who has written in the Q and A, and it's it's rather long. Um, I'm looking at the time; it's seven sixteen. I um, I would like to open it up to discussion from the audience, which is actually fairly big because, of course, the show is big, um, which is wonderful. Um, many peripheries. Uh, I'm, so the, the question is from David Lieberman. Is it a question or is it a statement? And can I let David speak? <laughs> because I think it would be a lot easier. Hi, David. Uh, hello, can you hear me? 
Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. No, it, it is both question and statement. And I always felt that keyboarding is something Thelonious Monk should do. And I, I find it awkward. And might I, uh, I know uh, Leila Hewick had, had asked that we, we all appear on the screen. And I know that's another way of doing these things. And it might be nice. It is an opening. We are, you know, chatting within the exhibition. But uh, ha having said that for a moment, let me, I will try and uh, read my question. It had to be in, in two parts because uh, they do limit your characters, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, and as well, Dimitri and Colin know, sometimes I'm too wordy. So uh, thank you, Dimitri and guests. As a provocation, I would suggest that each of you is considered seeking the periphery from a position of being within. Arguably, it could also be construed as seeking the periphery from without. It is not about the physical resistance of material containment. And, you know, I would uh, hear that uh, as many of you were formerly and traditionally referencing architecture, but rather the blurred threshold of distinction set by the improvised and choreographed occupation and temporary tendency in moments of pause. In Joseph Rickwart's text in Adam's House in Paradise, he notes that nowhere in the scriptures is there a description of the primitive hut, but only the garden. And we must remember that the threat came not from the darkness and mysterious force beyond the periphery, but from the serpent within the garden. I am perplexed by the desire then for home could we and should we not consider recognizing the edge but moving beyond its intellectual and physical construct in furthering the ideas of belonging and displacement it is not about ownership but custodianship and further it is discussed at length by critics such as Ariella Azule and I think it's she's a particularly appropriate given Samantha's work and commentary both in terms of Ariella's selection of imagery uh, and I don't want to say representation for other reasons uh, and the critical uh, social and political position are we seeking the periphery or are we gripping the thin edge of the world with our fingernails afraid to reach out i hope not in the spirit of an exhibition opening even if you continue to mute us it would be nice to share video presence of community and collectivity we are inscribed and contained in a great circle the great spirit has descended to earth in the form of an eagle who folds its wing to shelter the people and with its talon draws a circle in the earth. This is the place of the people. I Thank hope you, I have David. Um, you. We should have had you introduce the uh, exhibition at the beginning because uh, that was really beautiful. But, but, but David, um, David. Who then are not not the people? Well, uh, is it, uh, I would like to believe in my utopian naive idealism that uh, it has never been about exclusivity. Uh, oh. and despite no, oh. Uh, oh. no, 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 but wait, bear with me for it's a moment. Always been about exclusivity. Oh, yes, but there are those of us who feel that we must uh, constantly challenge the notion of exclusivity. And that is why I return to that question of are you challenging from within or from without? And uh, what then, um, uh, you know, I'd look to someone like uh, Wendy Brown in her discussion of walls. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think uh, these very much get to issues of, of gender. Uh, of, uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I didn't want to push that much politically, Colin, but I, as you know, I'm happy to engage it. But I, I think it, it's more about whether it was the issues of represent, Colin, would you like to... representation uh, is how do we question these exclusive boundaries through uh, the eloquence of perhaps 
our imagery and not only our words. Which is why in your work you are saying, and you know, they're not really sure at the European Graduate School why I'm drawing. <laughs> if that's yeah. fair. Yeah. I missed well, the last you know, few words. Can you repeat those? Right, no, Colin, go ahead. Uh, I've said enough. Well, but to, to me, uh, David just said that uh, he's responding to my comment that the people at PGS aren't sure why I'm drawing. Well, some of them certainly are. You know, when when I when I speak, right. for example, to Avatel Ronell or or um, uh, Judith Butler, they understand why I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. Right? They they certainly understand it. Um, I would say, you know, some of the some of the faculty don't understand, but that's fine. But 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 then I might respond. And now that you bring up, um, you know, well, we go from Wendy Brown to Judith Butler, and then I would shift then to actually Anne Carson. And the reason I bring Anne Carson to because she draws with words. Now there there is her book Knox, which does have imagery. But the most powerful of her texts would be the translations of the fragments of Sappho if not winter, where rather than like all the other scholars, she inserts the missing bits or they insert the missing, she leaves the appropriate blank on the page for you to navigate, to imagine, yeah. uh, to dream. And uh, this first became uh, true actually in her uh, dissertation at U of T uh, with Derek de Kirchhoff, who for many years was uh, director of the McLuhan Institute. Sure. And uh, Anne's work was published as Heirs the Bittersweet, in which she describes uh, the Greek language uh, and uh, being one of the first to insert the sounds of, uh, of vowels. I initially, it was not there. The same was true actually of ancient Hebrew. Um, and uh, it goes back to something, Colin, you and I have discussed, which I uh, call the space between notes. Right. Okay, so one can certainly draw with text, but the yeah. exhibition to return to that and your comments on representation uh, has given primacy to the visual. And sorry, I've, I've said enough. There are many others who want to so speak. This is, this is wonderful. Thank you, David. And thank you, Colin. I just want to um, invite Shem Rogerson Bader to uh, perhaps ask her question in, in uh, with, with her audio. Um, can we let her into this space? Let them into this space, forgive me. Hi, Shem. Hi. Um, I just have to go back to what I wrote. I didn't write it down anywhere else. I can read it for you, <laughs> but you know, it's better if you're- I've got, I, I've got it now, Dimitri, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Um, all of the panelists, thank you so much for your um, thoughtful insights. Um, I have a question about this idea of the periphery and can the periphery be the margins? And if so, what are your thoughts on Johnny Cash's quote, if you're not on the margins, you're taking up too much space. Hmm. Again, thank you for all your brilliant insights. I'm really grateful to be part of this. I love Johnny Cash. Um, I, think, I think you are. <laughs> um, but who's to say? I guess it's, it's very- I uh, tell a story that's, um that your, your question just tweaked in me, but is kind of off the mark somehow. <laughs> is that okay? Yep. Um, this is a, a, a bit of um, historical research that, that came to me from, uh, um, oh my goodness, I've just forgotten. I've just lost and I had it a moment ago. Um, uh, this uh, wonderful philosophy professor at the University of Toronto, whose name will probably come to me in the middle of this, um, but um, she's done research, historical research on the on the derivation of the term deadline. Okay, and this does have to do with margins, by the way. 
the so where this comes from is um, prison camps, southern U.S. prison camps during the Civil War. Uh, and there's one particular prison camp, a notorious one that I don't remember, that was rectangular in form, rectangular in plan form. And, you know, against the edge, there was a fence. And then inside the fence, there was something like 10 feet where you weren't allowed to step. Right? And if you stepped on those 10 feet, it was fair game for the guards to shoot you. Okay. And so that was the original deadline, is this space inside the prison camp where if you, if you walk over that line, you die. And it just happened that after the war, a, lot, a number of people who were in that camp uh, went back to New York and became journalists. And the word deadline transferred into the temporal deadline that we all know now. But I think this has something to say about, about the question of margin. And it's, it's a question of, of periphery as well, because there, there's a way in which if you're on the margin in some way, you're not allowed to be alive. There are, there are people who don't want you to be, and I, I'm, I'm over, I'm exaggerating here, but, but um, Dimitri, maybe you can pick up on that because I see you nodding your head. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was also thinking about, it's almost the end of the term and students have deadlines, but um, <laughs> aside from that, this, yeah, it's, uh, well, control and freedom and free choice, uh, you know, I, I actually never thought of the idea of the margin equals or, or somehow in some sort of formulas related to periphery uh, and particularly from, from your, your story right now, Colin, but it does uh, present a different side. Um, and, uh, <sighs> You know, nobody's really talked yet, or maybe that's okay because we're all aware of it anyway, but the sort of uh, uh, um, the politics and, and, and the issue of power and control, et cetera, and who has the say. And, you know, we're, you know, we're all on the periphery, but we also all have power. Um, and it's really incumbent on us as individuals to figure out how to exercise mm -hmm. that power <clears throat> uh, carefully. Um, you know, sometimes obviously we see many examples of it not being managed very well at every level, right? Um, I, I, I do like the way you think, Colin, in terms of thinking these things through to, to the extreme, because it really does illustrate quite well without drawing but with words um some of the you know the 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 problems and the kind of beauty of thinking about these things i find it quite liberating to think about the margin or the periphery and being um it's given <clears throat> and this is really a, a personal thing but i moved to the periphery of sorts from urban to rural and life changed as it, as it was expected to. Um, my viewpoint on urbanism, my viewpoint on Toronto, which is my hometown, how it's changed in, in the 50 years, 56 years that I've lived there. I mean, I, I think a lot about the power, the, you know, the level, all the levels of government and, you know, and, and, and the lack of maybe, uh, or the abandonment of power that architects actually have. I think we, we uh, could do more for, the, for good and, and think more carefully about what we choose, who we choose to work with, whether it's developers or whomever, and, and maybe exercise a little bit more power um, from 
you know, from the periphery because we usually think of our role as not being that important. But in fact, if you really think about it, you know, without, without us, you can't build anything bigger than 6,000 square feet. So I, it's very complicated. Um, I, can I uh, jump in here? Please. Uh, hi, Shem, first of all. And uh, I liked the question very much or the comment um, because I do think, I, I might add to that if you're, I can't, I can't remember the Johnny Cash quote already, but <laughs> I'll, I'll just take it on the way I think of it that, yeah, better to be at the margin. If you're too much at the center, you're not at the right place in my, in my, and then there's a whole clamor to be at the center now with us being on technologies and social media and, and the self-destructive nature of trying to do that as well. So better to be at the barge. And, and I would add to what Shem's saying that um, I think ambiguity is an ethical place, especially those of us who are situated in power um, need to be questioning our own marginality and letting ourselves be marginal at times. I'm going to add that's to that. Samantha, I was going to say jump Samantha. In and just add to that. Actually, this whole discussion is making me think of one of my favorite theorists, Lala Abulukhut, who's an Egyptian critical anthropologist who's written actually about that relationship, uh, uses different words that are more relevant perhaps in that discipline, um, but talks a lot about this idea that instead of looking at existing within or without, which is some of the concepts that have been mentioned so far, uh, looking at that relationship. So our relationship to the context, our relationship to the periphery. So if I can translate a little bit, our relationship to the margin, our relationship to the periphery helps us to start thinking about the space in between. So um, I think you mentioned this, Dimitri, we're not, we're, we're, we're never here or there completely. We're in that relationship and that fluidity. I think the minute we try to anchor and say, I'm in the center, I'm in the margins, either we're claiming that marginality as a badge of something, which can become problematic on its own, or we're claiming that center in a, in a, in a historically repressive way. And so there's a, there's a way of thinking about how we connect and how we relate and how we're positioned that's different than locating ourselves here or there. Um, and I think that's, that's that's really important to think about, especially today. That's great. I, I, I'm um, thinking about winding things down um, and uh, just because of time and I promise the panel, panelists an hour and we're now at an hour and five minutes. So last words from our friends. And then I, I think those questions that were asked by, uh, by our guests in the audience were awesome and uh, actually contributed a great deal. Um, Colin, would you like to say your last word? I know that's <laughs> well, I a lot you could. Can... <laughs> uh, thank you, Dimitri. This was, this was fun. And I actually, I think I have some new ideas coming out of this that will be useful. Great, thank so you. Thank you and for participating. See, look at the, the, the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but there, is a, there is a comment on the chat. Would Sana, Emily, or Andrea have anything to say? Hmm. Um, I guess I'll speak for us. Um, I think this is a really, I, I'll speak about the experience of curating behind the scenes and um, assisting Dimitri in this process. It's been months of work um, and really finding, um, I guess, the right way to um, give a platform for all these different voices. So I think we wanted to be really sensitive to all the different artists and all the different topics and themes that came out of this. Um, so it, it's been a really, it's been a pleasure for all of us to kind of be part of this. Um, I also want to thank um, 
Stephen Jones and Jack Hash, uh, Alex and Eileen, who helped with all of the background work. And um, it, it's really, I, I guess the virtual platform has its um, limitations, but it's, it's great to get together and have these discussions. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Andrea, Emily, would you like to add anything? I think Santa basically summed up uh, my thinking. I think it's been, it's been awesome just going through all these different projects from this amazing range of artists, architects, students. It's been a great experience. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that says a lot. Like all the work was amazing to look at and um, just the diversity of, of all the submissions as well. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Um, Samantha, fine. I want to say thank you. <laughs> and it's so exciting uh, to be able to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, so, you know, instead of just going to the functional meetings that we have to go to, this was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, okay. to you and to the other curators. Thank you. And Ken started us off, so he gets the last word. Thank you. Well, I have a good compliment to make for this show. I, uh, you know, I worked, Santa, Andrea, Emily, Dimitri, I know you worked into last night, maybe even into this morning. So last night I looked um, at the exhibit. Um, and actually before I say that, Alini, uh, thank you for your comment about Richard there. Um, um, I, um, I had a dream last night, a really vivid dream. And it was about being in a large warehouse space where all sorts of creative activities were going on and, um, and lots of movement and people. And, and uh, yeah, let me just leave it at that. So I actually felt I dreamt out of this exhibit. And I think that's a great compliment, <laughs> the, the imagination that went in and the strength of the show. So thank you for involving me. Well, thank you kindly. Um, the last thing I would like to add is a thank you and a toast to all the artists who've submitted, artists, architects, writers, all sorts of people. I'm just using the word artist very generally. Uh, thank you for this general <laughs> and specific conversation tonight. Um, to everybody, um, I'm really grateful. Uh, have a great night. Enjoy the exhibition. It'll be up for a long time. Uh, check it out. If you have any questions, comments. What, one, more thing. Thing. one more thing. Colin? Uh, uh, one, of, one of my hats this year is as actual um, curator, I guess, of the gallery. Um, so um, I think it's my job since nobody else really is in a position to do it, to say thank you to Dimitri for his work on this project, which is terrific. So thank congratulations, thank you. And we'll talk- Cheers everyone, cheers thank everyone. You, everyone. Have Happy a good spring. Thank Happy spring. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye.